brothers and sisters, grace and peace be to you today on this glorious day. It is my hope and prayer that as you hear God's word, you are inspired and filled for such a time. So we are going to be taking the lesson from Luke chapter 24. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands, my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. Today we are going to do a bit of an experiment as part of discovering God's good word for us today. We're going to go forward, but backwards. If just for a few moments you can take the time to imagine yourself on a path towards some kind of enlightenment where the destination is out there beyond where you can see, you don't have a map, no signposts, or even a clear road with shoulders. Just a general notion that you are moving beyond where you are and in the general direction away from where you have been. Now in your mind, turn your back to that unknown destination and look back to where you came from and start walking backwards. Uncomfortable? <laughs> yeah, uncomfortable, of course. But in some ways, it is the very thing that Jesus is asking his disciples, having returned to them in the flesh following the resurrection. The disciples have been frightened, they've been confused, lost, and maybe even paralyzed. They do not want to move forward. Jesus' words, actions, and the very recent past events are all a whirl in their heads and hearts. How can they move forward? They have no idea what has just happened. Jesus bloodied on the cross. Jesus, empty tomb, no body. And even though Jesus prepared them, including for that very day of confusion, they are stuck. His approach is genius. I want to show you that Jesus has prepared us for this very day that we are living in too. Amazing as it sounds. It is true. If you find yourself looking around for the answers to all the questions, good. If Jesus were to just suddenly show up in your daily life, pick an activity, any activity really, and unannounced came aside you in your daily life and then said to you, these are my words that I spoke to you, leaving it there. What in the world would you think or say? Let me mind read for you. I think you would say, not just a little confused and stunned, what words? Now you can place yourself in the place of the disciple. Indeed, what words? And to add to the puzzle, what if Jesus merely said, you are my witnesses of these things? Your immediate response? I think it would be, what things? 
The recorder of this conversation is very careful with what is included and what is not immediately spelled out. Why do I say that? Because that was Jesus' way. A greeting that elicits a question is what was intended. The answers to the question in their minds were not given first, at least in that particular conversation. They were given them in the most recent past for the disciples. In the lessons upon lessons upon lessons Jesus gave them. Wouldn't they know? But no, they're in confusion just like we are today. Does Jesus allow for confusion? Does he stir it? Well, I'm going to say he stirs it for the pursuit of a relationship, a connection, and an understanding. A questioner is an engaged learner. A puzzled follower is going to look to the leader or the teacher. And in so doing, the relationship and the lesson is strengthened. Hear these words. You'll hear them throughout my message. Eyes on me. As students and followers of Jesus, sometimes when we read scripture, we just autofill. We don't pause for deeper understanding, and that can be a problem if the point of understanding the words and actions of Jesus is not to only find a better way through what you are experiencing now, but to grow closer to the source of all love, peace, and joy. To grow, to be an engaged listener and learner. Well, then questions are good. When Jesus tells the disciples, you are the witnesses of these things, you will see that the reference point of these things is something from the disciples' past. After all, you can only be a witness to something if you have, in actuality, witnessed them in the past. But the clarity of exactly what Jesus means by these things does not come until after he has led them to ask themselves the question that quite obviously stems from Jesus' confusing leading sentence. They have to ask themselves what things to come to the next steps. One step at a time, Jesus is forcing them to think, to review, and to mine the treasure trove of his time among them. To live in the future with the past in mind, to do this rather than quake in fear, it's what he has intended. Very soon he will be gone as they have come to know him fully, and he will be with them in ways they just will not be able to fathom if they do not do the work of listening hard, reviewing the lessons and the history, gathering together to pool shared understanding and experience, and to, well, oddly enough, to just eat together. But we get ahead of ourselves. To be who they were redeemed to be, to accomplish their mission, they are going to have to be broadly equipped. Do they have all they need? Do they know all they must? Did they play, pay close enough attention? Of course, there the answer is no. I want you to just think of Jesus pleading with them, beads of bloody sweat dripping down his brow while he prays in the garden. Can't you just stay with me this one hour? The answer, no. Back to sleep, they went. We have lots of evidence that they were clueless, just as we often are. One of the top lessons they need to learn is that Jesus means it when he says, Lo, I am with you always. With them? Who, me? How? Always? The lessons come together in this lovely scenario of our gospel text in Luke. And it comes because Jesus invites them to go forward walking backwards. I have been training a puppy for a friend who has never owned a dog. Puppies, especially toy puppies, are a bundle of joy and nerves, kisses and confusions. They are often underfoot, one step, and they are a goner, and they know it. <laughs> and they, they live that way. <laughs> Enter 
our English Golden Retriever, the most relaxed dog you will ever find. One loud bark of no when the puppy wants to bite his tail or even sniff around his tail, and the puppy goes flat on his belly, communicating, don't eat me. <laughs> that is why it is terribly important to help the puppy know the rules, boundaries, and expectations, and to learn from whence comes all the life lessons to keep him safe. Lesson one, all eyes on me. You communicate to the dog in every way possible that you get rewarded if you pay attention. Both fun and safety are happening right here in this tight little circle, eye-to-eye -eye communication being key. He doesn't know that paying attention to the handler is the route to all safety and good as well. Out in the yard on the leash, you will see the puppy's awareness of his vulnerability. A leaf blows by in the grass, he braces. A car drives by, he braces. A bird flies over, he braces. It is all threat to him until he learns that his handler is his protector. All eyes on me. He gets lost in his mind, eight pounds of fun and fear, cuteness and chaos. The handler needs to bring order to the puppy's world before the puppy brings complete disorder to theirs with all his fears and all his fantasies. All eyes on me. You want to go forward. Look first. In our story, Jesus picks up where he left off at Emmaus, where he, where he suddenly is revealed at the table at the breaking the bread, even though he has been with them the whole day, walking along the road and asking questions on the journey to Emmaus. Today's text is where Jesus again enters in in a gathering that pretty much immediately follows Emmaus. Those who had shared in the meal in Emmaus had seen Jesus suddenly disappear. They returned to Jerusalem, finding the 11 and their companions gathered together. Verse 34 says the disciples had been saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and, and he appeared to Simon. Well, those who had walked with and eaten with Jesus just before told the disciples what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here Jesus appears in the discussion, in the sharing of what they had witnessed. Can we dare say that Jesus enters those discussions, draws near and reveals himself? Not in the drawn out conversations about the pandemic of fear that gripped them, not in the wranglings of power, political and spiritual, but in the sharing of the witness and in the question. Here it is that Jesus enters saying, peace be with you. Holy doodle, they were startled and frightened. Oh, a leaf blowing in the wind, brace. Bird ahead, brace. Jesus suddenly appearing, brace. Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, see that it is myself. It is I, myself, touch me and see. And your pastor asks you, do you hear it? All eyes on me, Jesus is communicating. And it literally says in this story, while they were in their joy, they were disbelieving. Back to the puppy on the leash. No, really, it is a bird. You're safe. Eyes on me. I just had a visit with a dear friend who is now on hospice. We spoke of his pain. We spoke of his life. We spoke of his fear. And I asked him what one thing, one memory or gift has been getting you through this time. He said, and immediately, joy, his voice breaking. He continued, I'm not talking about happiness, but joy. It is hard sometimes to carry it, he said, but it is here, pointing to his heart. From Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Wow, he is living it, and I am witness. 
The book of Luke shares, while they were in their joy, they, the disciples, were disbelieving. Did Jesus kick them out of the inner circle? No. Did Jesus rebuke them? No. Evidently, it is okay to carry disbelief with the joy. Evidently, disbelief is not a qualifier or a disqualifier to carry joy. Jesus' presence brought joy. My friend who is preparing to enter heaven's gates is not in the same room with Jesus, showing hands and side, but he is in the same room. Heaven's gate is open wide and has spilled out to that very moment. My friend has the joy that comes from a holy source, from Jesus' own presence. He is giving witnesses as others have before him, for him. Jesus is here. See with eyes of faith, eyes on me. In the disciples' joy and disbelief, what is Jesus going to say next? Can you imagine the scene? He knows that they are in joy and disbelief. What is his next move? He asks them, do you have something to eat? I love that. This is crazy, crazy good. It is all too far beyond them to contemplate. It's just so far beyond their minds are blown. And so Jesus takes it right down to something they can do right then and there that they have done many times together, eat. And they serve him. Don't forget Jesus has reminded them to feed others as part of their calling as a disciple. That's one of the lessons in the treasure trove. Over and over this lesson has been taught. And now he walks with them into the future, their backs to it, looking at the past as they do, as they have been asked to do, and will be asked to do in the near future. Gather, invite, eat. And in the eating and in the gathering, their minds are open yet again to all that has been taught. And he says, these are the words that are to be spoken and were spoken while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus starts by going backward. These words, what words? <laughs> it comes out of the blue. And so then it invites a question, that question, what words? And it provokes confusion of another kind for the disciples than the ones they have been living in. What words? All that has been written about me, look back, Look back further. Look back for me in the law, the Psalms, the prophets, the Old Testament writings, the past. Look there. And then right there, he opens their minds so they can see it. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name and to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. So you, you all, we all are in a pandemic, the pandemic for our times. There's a lot of fear. There are a lot of failings. There's confusion and consternation. And it is leading to a lot of unbalance across our nation, across the whole world, right in our little community. On one level, this is not personal, but it is also very personal. It cannot be controlled, but that does not mean we have nothing to do. We start by acknowledging our fear and the fears of those around us. We start by acknowledging our power and our powerlessness. Some are more vulnerable than we. Seeing that is not only an option, 
but it's an obligation. This pandemic is not personal, but it is commonly shared. We are in it together. And the word together is one that spreads across the expanse of understanding of time and space. How to be in this pandemic together? Well, as I mentioned, first observe the vulnerability of it all for everyone. Now and again, with our back to the future, walking forward together, backwards, we look to what Jesus has taught. We look to the witness that we have been given in our lifetime. And we acknowledge that we are witnesses to what has been poured out among us. Jesus does not hammer a list of do's and don'ts here. He doesn't tell us what to do about policy and gathering specifically, but he does remind us of our callings. He reminds us that repentance and forgiveness is to be proclaimed to all, to all nations. And you are my witnesses. Give witness. Oh, and don't forget and eat. Jesus is with us. Jesus has prepared us for such a time. We don't have to scurry around gathering what we think we need. We have what we need. And we have each other. And we have a calling. And it is a good calling. Let us live it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.